Family Support Night, November edition, and we are honored to have our special guests from the League of Women Voters. We have Beth, and let me try and get this right, Pella Chiotti. Pella Ch Very good. Okay. Yeah. Um, from the League of um, Women Voters, and she is going to share with us some good civic information information and help us understand the legislative process a little more. And we are honored also to have her son, Representative Pella Ch Chiotti, yeah. um, State Representative from the 30th District, correct? That's right. And also um, the um, State Treasurer elect um, in our state. And so welcome. Thank and you. It's great with to that, here. I'll let you go ahead and um, go from there. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I always hesitate here making sure I get this right. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. So, um, glad to be with you this evening and glad to know that this is being recorded so that we can all look at this in the future. My name is Beth Palacciati. And I'm giving you my email address if you have any questions you would like to get back to me after this presentation. Um, I'm representing the League of Women Voters of the Spokane area. Um, I'm here with Mike Pelciotti, and he's been introduced. Uh, he's the uh, representative from the 30th Legislative District and State Treasury elect. And um, I think I've met uh, everyone on the presentation. Uh, as people join us, they might, you know, we might, uh, Darcy, have them introduce themselves. Uh, so I, I want to give you a bit of a history of the League of Women Voters. Uh, we're, we're all about history. We're 100 years old. So a bit about history um, in the past and today, talking about uh, where you can get more information on state, tribal, and local government structures. Um, talking about advocacy at the local and state level channels and resources. And then uh, really pleased that Mike Pelciotti can be here today to have a discussion with us about uh, what makes successful advocacy from a perspective of a legislator. I think you'll find that really interesting and, and questions that we might have for him. So in looking at um, advocacy, I, I, uh, I, I think about over time and uh, one of the, obviously big issues for the League of Women Voters is voting. And one of the areas of advocacy with voting that took a long time was women fighting for the right to get to vote. Uh, and we always kind of phrase this that they weren't given the right to vote, they fought for the right to vote. And uh, this, this time frame is, is sometimes we think of that amendment passing um, and being ratified for women to get the right to vote in 1920. And we think, oh, a few years before that, this was when it all started. But actually, um, one of the starting points might be um, by historians going back 72 years before 1920 in 1848. And this is where I'm from, which is in upstate New York, is Seneca Falls Women's Convention. Uh, one of the, uh, this was a group of women and men meeting uh, in Seneca Falls, New York, to look at uh, proposing a number of tenants for the right for women, um, women's rights. And one of the more radical ones was women having the right to vote. This was in 1848. And this quote here, and this is the reason I put it in there was because of the time factor. Women sought, quote, immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. It wasn't very immediate. Um, so 72 years later, <laughs> women won the right to vote uh, in 1920. And here, here's, here's a pop-up quiz question. What, what state ratified the 19th Amendment? Mike, you can't answer. <laughs> what state ratified? And that's what this cartoon is about, talking about buttoning it up. It's a Southern state. It was a very close vote. Um, close, very close. <laughs> it, was, it was close. It was Tennessee. And the, the story of it is that um, it, was, it was pretty well tied uh, and that one legislator 
I think of Mike, when the legislator made a difference and he made a difference because his mother sent him a telegram telling him to vote <laughs> for women getting the right to vote. And that's, that passed in Tennessee and then that amendment to the constitution was ratified. Uh, but there was just a lot of work, a lot of advocacy work, women getting the right to vote. And one of the surprising things to, to think about, I guess, in looking at the history of that is that the, the, the strongest voices against women getting the right to vote were other women. Um, there were groups that were formed because women saw themselves losing um, some of their um, status that they had and some of the roles that they had that they felt would be eroded by them voting. Uh, so this is a 72 year advocacy. I'm gonna just stop, we had someone join us. Um, I'm Beth Pelciotti, could you introduce yourself? She's there? Maybe not, okay, I'll go ahead. Um, it's kind of fun yeah, when I show this. Sorry, sorry, Marcy, I'll just, um, if, if Julie, um, maybe doesn't know that it's her, she's the one that just joined us, but um, Julie is a very involved and active um, member of um, the Every Student Council Alliance here in, in Spokane. And then she also serves on the Spokane County DD board. There she is. Oh, hello. Hi, Julie. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for Sorry. joining us. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of a fun picture because I have a chance to talk to high school students a lot about the importance of voting. Every year the league goes into the civics classes we talk to Oh, in November and December of a year, we talked to 41 classes and about 50 classes in the spring. And so I've had a lot of chance to talk to high school students. And, and so I show them this picture uh, and I say, no, this is not the league today. This is the league <laughs> in 1920. So about six months before women um, won the right to vote, the League of Women Voters was formed. And it was really formed with the intent of helping women and men learn more about voting and the issues with voting. And in some large degree, we haven't changed that much over the years. Our mission right now is to empower voters and defend democracy. Uh, we are nonpartisan, so we do not support candidates or parties. Uh, and as you can imagine, around a general election that we just had, we're very busy, uh, not only registering voters, but helping voters get more information to be more informed about the choices they make. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about the Spokane League and here's another 72 years. So we requested recognition as a local league in 1948. So the 72 years take us to 2020. And um, I just grabbed a couple of things about what we're doing, um, what we've done in the longer past. We had a vote mobile. This is a picture of the vote mobile. <laughs> I don't know who drove that tractor trailer, <laughs> but that was our vote mobile in 1954. Um, in 1963, and the league does a lot of advocacy work. In 1963, they wrote a letter to Congress about pollution in the Spokane River. So much of what we do is advocacy and voter information. And then taking it to today, um, we, do, we do a lot of work and voter outreach to underserved and underrepresented groups. Uh, one of our very recent um, initiatives has been working with communities in Spokane whose first language is not English. And we translated the general election ballot. This was no small task. Um, we had it translated into six different languages and made those, those um, translated ballots. That they weren't the ones people filled out but the translation so they could understand better how they were voting. Um, and, and you remember from the ballot, which I'm sure you all filled out, it was long and that was all translated. <laughs> so people had a better understanding of, of when they use the ballot to, to, to be informed in their decision making. Um, we do advocacy. Oh, I like the clapping hands. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> uh, at the local, state and national level. Uh, Right now at the national level, the League of Women Voters is very involved in litigation uh, related to the election. And uh, prior to the election, uh, involved in litigation related to voters' rights. Uh, so it, it is at, at, at every level we, we do advocacy. Um, 
one of the, I put this is very, very recent. I was in training on Saturday. So that's how recent this is. Uh, and I had talked to Darcy a bit about this when she and I met. Uh, we are looking in the spring uh, to train members of the community and league members in um, working with, um, we call it speak up schools, but we're learning the basics of advocacy and telling stories uh, about the needs of the community as we work with, and there's a commission that is doing redistricting, the legislative maps, they'll be meeting in the summer and um, they will have public hearings, public sessions for us to talk about how legislative maps should be drawn. And we wanna be prepared for that. So we're being trained and we're gonna be offering training. I'll be sending that to Darcy uh, as we move into um, January uh, to how, how we would give good testimony at these hearings. And, and the maps are only done, it's like a meteor. It's every 10 years, it's dependent on census data. And so we just want to be well prepared and we'd like to have good community um, representation as we do our speak up <laughs> testimony to these, um, to the commission on redistricting. Beth, I have a question about um, the, um, In the, other, uh, the language. Um, the, the for the voter register or for the um, ballots, the, yes, the yes. different language translations. I seem to remember, um, I think you guys were partners on um, voter registration week where um, we had um, Senator Billig and Secretary, or um, Vic, not, was Vicki Dalton was there and we're talking yeah. about how um, census data determined like, could our Secretary of State pay for some of that translation, but only if they're a certain percentage of the population? Yeah, yeah Darcy, and, and you're, you're so, so good you picked up on that. That's how that project started, because Vicki Dalton was presenting to us. We said, well, what about these other languages that we have here in Spokane? And she said the federal, I think it's the federal regulations say that it has to be, up, I think it, it, there's a threshold of 5% of the population. And then it, it, you require the Secretary of State's required to do the ballot translation. And so after that meeting, um, one of our members, Susan Hales, met with Vicki Dalton and said, well, we want to do that because this is really important for members of our community to better understand the ballot. And uh, Susan's really, <laughs> it's quite amazing. She, she got grant money from the Smith Barbieri Fund to pay for it. And then the league put up additional funds because translation is, is not inexpensive. It's, it's an expensive thing to do. Uh, and so that's, that took, this project took about a year because that was from last summer, not this summer, a year ago. Yeah. That's, that's how that started. That, that one question at that meeting that we were all at in that Spokane, it's downtown it library. And made it happen. That's great. Yeah, effort. made it happen. It's, it's a good memory on that. So Beth, I don't know if you have um, the chat up on yours, but Julie commented um, about women voting, uh, that women still feel that way um, about voting today and many other issues within the political and social structures, that many women voted against Hillary Clinton because they didn't believe a woman should be allowed to be president. And we heard a lot of that. Yeah. Um, I, I was, you know, we had a speaker, uh, this was not this summer, the summer before, who'd written a book and really, she was a historian and, a, and, and also a very adept storyteller. And she talked about the opposition that, that women had to the 19th Amendment. And um, one of the things that we learned, um, and that this could be a whole talk, is how, how different that was in the Western states that you know, the, the state of Washington in 1910 granted women the right to vote. And Wyoming was the, at that time a territory granting women in the Wyoming territory right, right to vote. Um, so it was, the opposition from women was not just, you know, it, it, it wasn't universal, uh, but I, I think it's, it's not just in the past either, as Julie said. Uh, either. That's a good comment. And, and I appreciate if you can read the chat because it's, you know, it's a little challenge to be reading the chat and presenting at the same time. So, so she also just um, posted, are there currently any populations that reach the 5% threshold at the federal level to require translations? 
I'm not sure. I will find out though and let you know. I, the only reason I'm hesitating, I, I'm going back to the conversation that we had with Vicki Dalton Darcy. I don't think we had any in Spokane. Do you remember? Oh, I, I will find out because again, I, I but, remember being so surprised that um, that because I think we very much think of ourselves as not very diverse, but how like even a population, I can't remember. It seemed like even a population that I thought would be large enough to make it still hadn't made it, but I don't. I, I, I seem to remember that too, but I will, I will definitely let you know. Um, obviously, this, this gets into the whole issue of the importance of the census, which is another whole presentation we've all probably heard, um, and the counting. Um, Do they expect is. any, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, delay is because we extended the um, the census and then they closed it early, right? After they- um, let, me, let me ask Mike, because Mike's my, my government expert. The census, do you, <laughs> you are. You're, you're in trouble, uh-oh, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that is setting me up for a fall right there. No, you're, uh, no you're not. <laughs> so what, tell me about, what, what is happening on the census right now? It, it, it was going to be extended and then got stopped. Is that it, Mike? Yeah, well, that, that's my understanding is it, and, and that I think it's it, essentially the, the it's, it's run its course now at this point. So I, I don't think my, the latest I had heard was that it, essentially it's been, uh, it's, it's run its course. Um, and, you know, there've been challenges with the federal government for a number of reasons where they've been trying to, to limit the counting uh, that's been taking place in a very uh, unfortunate way, but but you know it, it you know and obviously the pandemic has raised a whole other set of hurdles that you know normally allow for a more efficient counting to take place as people normally would just go door to door. Um, you know that was a lot slower starting that process. So I, I do think that it, it's 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 a concern. And one of the things actually, uh, you know, I had introduced legislation uh, last session actually, um, to to address a lot of the issues around gerrymandering based on the, the importance of this initial census count because it affects so much of what takes place over the next uh, 10 years. Um, you know, luckily I think we've done a little bit better here in Washington state than some other states, uh, but, but it, it has been a concern throughout the whole year to make sure everyone's counted. Yeah, good questions. Um, Julie also pointed out uh, that the second largest population of non-English speaking people in Spokane is Marshallese. And she says she doesn't know the total size of the population, uh, but wonders what the percentage here in Spokane is. I've got my questions. I know my friend Susan Hales are here. She'd be able to tell you that off the top of her head. Okay, great. Um, just, just a bit um, to move into this on civics. Um, I'm chairing a committee on civics education at the, the, for the state league, um, for the local leagues throughout the state. And, and we came up with this definition and, and I, 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 I underline the part I like the best because it's such a broad definition that's important. It's learning the basic structures and processes of our government. And then the second part is understanding our responsibility and privilege and shaping the kind of community we wanna live in. Um, we, we're, we're working on the civics project to find out what other local leagues are doing in civics education for adults. And we're focusing on adults because uh, we know that the high school requirement for civics was only passed a few years ago. Uh, and so we have over 30 years of civics not being required as a standalone course. There's a lot of adults, uh, if they've had civics, it's a long time ago, but a lot have not had civics. And we find, and this is not, not just for the public, but for league members, we are constantly having to learn more about civics. Uh, I was just at a meeting this morning to try to understand better, just for example, the, the structure with the regional health board and the structure with the state health board and how people are appointed to the regional health board. I mean, it's, it's a constant learning <laughs> to be able to be effective at what you do. You constantly have to, to learn more about government and processes. Um, so uh, we do a lot within our league and we do a lot with the public, especially as we work with people getting ready to vote. A lot of the questions are very basic, like Mike gets, like what does the state treasurer do? And <laughs> what, what does the clerk do in the county? 
what I'm voting for people. I don't know what those jobs are. Uh, so civics is constantly throughout so, so much of what we do and we work um, with voters and others in the league. Uh, so we have um, a textbook and I, I'm in this PowerPoint is the, the name of the textbook. If you just type into Google or whatever um, in your URL that you have, you say the state we're in and this will pop up. There's a digital version and it's free. You can download it. Uh, this is the textbook that's used in um, middle and high school. And, and sometimes you think, oh, this is a high school textbook, but I read it. This is great. <laughs> it's no, very yeah, clear. I, I took the opportunity to, I'm like more than halfway through, but I've been, um, I was reading it the other day and I'm, maybe I'm a nerd, but <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I never knew that. And I'm telling you. Oh, I know, me too. <laughs> me too. And, and there's, the, I put the three chapters you might want. I mean, they're all good, really. Um, but the chapter five is on governing Washington today. Chapter six is on tribal government. It's, it's an excellent chapter. Um, and chapter seven is, it's really the com more complex. This is the part I thought was so, the counties, the cities, the towns, the special districts. Um, it, it, it's, it's a really good um, introduction and, and, and overview of government functions and structures. Uh, just to point out, this is for middle and high school classrooms, though it's really good for adults. Uh, we have one for the elementary school children that's being developed. It should be out just about Thanksgiving. So you might want to look for that. Uh, and that will be, you know, for, I think, like primarily the primary grades. Uh, so we'll have textbooks for civics instructions from K through 12, really, uh, between these two, these two books. And I, I just want to emphasize, you don't have to buy the book. <laughs> My purpose tonight to have you buy the book. It is, it is available to download. I try, Darcy, it's get easy to download in each of these chapters. So. Uh, Darcy and I talked about, and you're probably more familiar than I am, um, some of the state and local resources and channels for advocacy. Uh, there's one on um, accommodations for voting called Informing Families. I, I just downloaded some of the policy topics you're really all familiar with, with the ARC. Uh, Disability Rights Washington, just involved with protection and advocacy is a governor, Governor's Commission on Disability Issues and Employment. And then I'm going to be really introducing Mike to talk about the Washington State Legislative um, process and bill information. And in, in the textbook, uh, the state we're in, there's, I don't know, Darcy, if you got to this part, point yet, uh, it's, it's a great process map of how a bill becomes a law. And I, I only did a slide on half of it. It's on page 72 of the textbook. Uh, Mike might take us through that too as we get into this, but uh, there's some complexity in how a bill becomes a law and there's steps along the way and you can track it, but it's nice to see this process map to kind of see how it all works. Uh, and, and sometimes when the bill doesn't move forward, what's, what's happening or what's stopping it. Um, so I found this particular process map in the book to be, to be really helpful. And with that, kind of quick overview. Barbara, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Beth Pelciati, and I see Barbara here. Let me let me let me stop there. Any comments or questions before I introduce Mike? And I, I think Mike just wants to have a kind of overall discussion with us and see what questions you might have and have more information in his role. Um, He's a state representative right now. He's a state treasurer elect. He's also my son. And I want to thank him for joining us uh, tonight. <laughs> um, I was going to say, in, in, no, in no particular order on that. I think that's the, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, no, no, I'll, I'll, look. I'll leave it to you, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, well thanks, thanks, for, thanks for teeing it up. And thanks for the opportunity to, to join all of you. You know, you know, one of the things I just want to follow up with, you know, that, you know, as my mom was just mentioning about, uh, you know, 100 years ago and uh, women fighting during the right, uh, fi fighting for the right to vote. And, but what we also know is that many people were denied uh, a voice and denied the right to vote for, for decades after that. Obviously, uh, Asian Americans, African Americans, Native Americans, and, and others 
you know, who did not, uh, you know, have, have access until, until more recently. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things I always appreciate is any organization that's working to give, give voice uh, to folks who sometimes don't, don't, aren't always heard as a part of the process, despite how impactful laws can be um, in at people's everyday lives. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to join all of you. I've appreciated the work of the ARC. I was mentioning earlier to Darcy that, you know, I've had a chance to join uh, the ARC of King County uh, over the years and a lot of the good advocacy work uh, that they do. And it's, it's nice to join uh, all of you from Spokane uh, as well. And, you know, I thought what might be helpful is we just have a conversation about a kind of the legislative process, uh, ways to, to be uh, impactful and, and helpful on, on issues that, 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 uh, that you care about and would like to see advanced within the legislative process. Um, and, you know, some of the, some of the challenges and, and how best to navigate it. So I, I'm happy to, to, to kind of share a little bit of an overview of the process, but where I thought it might be helpful is if you maybe just start first with any kind of questions or areas that might be most helpful for me to talk about uh, based on issues that you care about, where you see things might not have worked as well as you'd like to see on particular pieces of legislation, for example, or, or even just questions about, you know, how to, how to get something going and off the ground on, on issues that you care about. So before I kind of jump into anything, I thought it might be a good chance to see, see about any questions uh, or ideas that you have. Uh, yeah, so um, so I have some questions um, generally within um, education and especially within the special education realm, there seems to be lots of barriers and it's, it's bipartisan that there's lots of barriers with getting um, things passed for um, kids with you know disabilities, um, whether it be intellectual or developmental and and I'd be curious to hear your perspective of why that is such a struggle when, you know, this is not some, this is not a choice. This is not, I mean, this is something that is very natural. Um, and um, even with the Disabilities Act, I think it's 30 years old being passed, um, there's still so many barriers. Um, and, I, and I just, um, one of the things last year, we've been trying to raise the cap on special ed because it's capped out at 13.5%, and um, which means that that's a max amount of funding that will be divvied up at the state level in order to go to schools to cover the population. And like here in Spokane, uh, we have a, a really large number, um, larger than the rest of the state when it comes to um, the IDD population, but that cap basically, says that we can't, um, we only have resources for so many kids. And if there's kids on the outlier, then um, they're not gonna get anything. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, well, no, thanks for the question, Julie. I mean, I do think it, it raises one of the kind of initial challenges that often exists in, in trying to navigate uh, good policy is you, you sometimes have uh, federal legal limitations that might impact state policy. Um, and I think that you know, I think it's particularly frustrating, I think, for constituents because, you know, n nothing's worse than when government goes kind of kind of like this, right? They don't talk to me, go talk to this government, and then you could go talk to the other government. They say, well, go, go talk to your state legislators. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, I guess I'll speak specifically related to the, the opportunities to, to impact the, the state budget process. Um, I think, I'm, I really appreciate bringing that, that up because I think there are two aspects of the legislative process um, that come up potentially at different times. One is when you're dealing with particular policy related to laws and if you want the law to be written in a different way, if you want the law to do something different, if you want the law to grant uh, additional, additional rights or um, you know, you know, provide a, a, a different way of doing things. And then there's the budget uh, process, um, which often is, is just as important in, in making sure that there are the resources necessary to accomplish the things we want uh, to have done and to make sure that it's meeting the values that, that we want our government uh, accomplishing. Um, and, and I wanna kind of address those two, those, those two different things in, in two different ways, because if you have a policy idea, if you have something where you want the law to be different, if you want uh, something to be done differently, I really think it's, it's particularly helpful to meet with your elected officials before the legislative process. Um, so the legislature you know, meets every year in January and depending on uh, the year, uh, if it's an even year, uh, it meets, it's a short session, only meets about two months or so. Um, and then if it's a longer year, it's more like three or four months, um, a longer session, I should say it's about three or four months and that's what we're going into next. So it's called our, our kind of longer 
session and it's because it's a budget year. So we deal with the budget every other year. So this January into about May is gonna be uh, the next uh, budget legislative session. So it's gonna be dealing with the two different aspects. It will be dealing with policy issues, um, those kind of changing the laws. And then we'll also deal with the budget issues, kind of some of the things you were talking about where it's making sure there's sufficient money allocated to the things that, that we care about. Um, and uh, it, it's a really important time right now. And that's why I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation because that budget that's determined is essentially gonna be de determined for two years. It's a, it's, it's a biennium budget, meaning it's a kind of two year budget. And so if there's something that you think is important to, to change related to the actual budget process, um, the best time to do that is, is right now uh, going into this next budget, the next budget discussions. Of course, there are a lot of challenges with the current budget cycle, uh, given you know, some of the COVID responses, but it doesn't change the fact that it's, it's always important to be advocating for those, those budget priorities uh, that you have. I do think you can be impactful with the budget during the legislative session. So it's, uh, you know, sometimes those negotiations are taking place. Um, that is an effective time to really kind of put all hands on deck and making sure that all of your members in a grassroots way are communicating to their legislators about the issues um, that they care about. Because, you know, you know, budgets are being allocated, things are being moved, different priorities are being shaped and they're being shaped by the constituents that they hear from. Um, the, that is a little bit different than the legal issues, those policy issues, where if there's something you want the law to change, it's much better to address it with your members before the legislative session, which would be like right now, right now, the next two months, uh, to give your legislator an opportunity to write up a bill, introduce it, and the long process that sometimes takes place related to moving a bill through the process needs to start early. And I think one of the great shames that I've seen in our part-time legislature is people come up with very good legislative ideas and they'll contact their legislators during the legislative session, sometimes after the deadline has already passed for a particular committee to hear or pass that particular type of bill. And so I think uh, often, you know, from a grassroots standpoint, people get energized when the legislature is meeting, they're coming to meet with their legislators. And that is very, very important to advocate for bills that you might care about that are currently percolating in the legislature. But if you have a different idea on how things should be done, getting uh, connected with your legislator before the legislative session is really important. And again, I just wanna separate that from some of the budget uh, discussions that might otherwise be taking place during the actual budget processes as well. So hope, hopefully that kind of generally answers your question, Julie. This is Darcy and I, I have a kind of general question. I, I feel like, so we have concerns about the actual budget and COVID and um, the um, decision package that was, um, submitted by the Developmental Disability Administration. Um, I think COVID has really um, kind of highlighted inequities within a lot of the systems that serve our families because um, it's it's not, if, if cuts are made, it's not just gonna impact us. Um, our kids who are on waivers, my kid over there is having her own conversation. Um, but there's, there's school impacts, there's um, Medicaid impacts, there's um, social security impacts and um, but it's also, so let me back this up. I'm just trying to, it's really made me realize um, that the system, how it's working isn't really working and it hasn't for a long time. And I feel like for the last few years, we've been just kind of throwing bills at legislators and hoping something sticks instead of like, do you have any suggestions about real systems reform? Like how could we um, make a, like make real change to the DDA system so that more families could be served and um, actually receive um, services that they need? And how would you go about that? Is that having conversation? I mean, it's kind of too late for that kind of conversation. There's a little bug. Well, and, and to be clear, it's definitely not too late now okay. for next session. Let me be absolutely clear about that. The fact we're having this conversation now, you're already uh, well ahead of everyone else who's thinking about engaging in the legislative session. And you most certainly have time. And we're talking two months before the legislative session. You definitely, definitely have time right now. Um, you know, uh, let me see if I can kind of answer the question in kind of multiple parts. I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, from a larger standpoint, making sure that the legislature does not have an austerity budget is incredibly important, especially during these uh, challenging uh, economic times and what we're seeing from COVID because it's only amplifying the impact to, to so many uh, members of our communities around the state. Mm -hmm. And and I think, 
you know, that, that is something to communicate to, to your legislators. Um, I, I think that's something that is heard and appreciated uh, by legislators. And I think that's something that, you know, I'll just speak for my, my legislative caucus has been a priority to make sure uh, in the past that, that um, we're providing, uh, you know, funding and a lot of the resources that sometimes aren't necessarily uh, understood or necessarily even uh, fully appreciated by a lot of members of the public in terms of the, the importance of fully funding a lot of those groups to make sure those services are able to be uh, provided. Um, you know, in terms of specific changes within uh, administrations uh, to, to make sure that the services are being provided in, in a way that better meets the needs, um, you know, that's still a conversation, especially during this kind of off session time to have with your legislator about a specific thing that might not be working right. I think the more it can be tailored to a specific, a specific example, I, I, I you know, when I look at my colleagues, um, uh, you know, from both uh, both sides of the aisle, I, I think generally we try to be problem solvers, and 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 they want to to make things work for constituents. And so, if you can identify a specific problem, even if you don't necessarily know the solution, um, the advantage of communicating directly with your legislator, especially when they're not quite as busy, you know, during the off session right now, is they can help navigate where there might be the the hiccup within a particular administration. Um, you know, in terms of the actual application of of the law. And, and sometimes that requires a change. Sometimes if you can bring up that issue, um, you might hear from uh, an administrator of that agency who might say, well, we need additional funding to do X or Y to accomplish what we want to achieve. And then it's something specific and that can be part of the budget request from that agency to address that issue. So I, I guess that the most important uh, thing, I guess, to, to leave any type of uh, advice would be doing exactly what you're doing right now, which is engaging the conversation today um, so over the next two months, um, before the legislative session starts, you can be identifying, you know, what are the real top two or three issues that you uh, identify as, as real a problem where it's not, not, things aren't getting done, things aren't working right. And, and it'll help identify, is, is it a budget issue? Is it maybe not increasing budgets, but just allocating money in a different way or in a more efficient way? Um, uh, you know, or is it, you know, a, a issue with the way the law is written? And it might require some some new law to be introduced by a legislator, all of which can be accomplished uh, right now over the next two months uh, before going into the legislative session to to address that. And I think um, agencies submit their own budgets to the governor and ultimately to the legislature on what the recommendations are. Um, and those those come earlier too. Those will be coming over the next few months. And so being a part of this conversation out with your legislator can sometimes break through what can sometimes be frustrating conversations with a particular government agency, because. Um, you know, not always, but one of the advantages of being a legislator is you get your, your phone calls returned. Um, and so if you call an agency in which uh, things aren't working for a constituent, um, you know, they tend to be responsive to the needs of legislators. It doesn't mean things are going to necessarily just change, but but you'll at least identify where there, there might be room to improve things. So I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> so everybody that's on this call today um, has made trips to Olympia. We have all talked to our legislators during session and mm -hmm. probably outside of session as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what is your opinion on um, the best and most meaningful way to reach out to legislators during this pre-legislative session time? Um, if we have a whole group, I mean, we've got a, a mass community of people, of families with uh, individuals with disabilities, and we all kind of have the same, um, the same needs, the same things that, that are troublesome that we would like to address. You know, from your standpoint, would you rather get 50 letters from 50 individual people um, would you rather get, you know, more of, hey, this is how we feel there's an issue and this is what we'd like to change and this is how we see maybe that a change could happen, but that's signed by 50 people or do you want, you know, 50 people knocking on your door for 10 different appointments? What's the most meaningful way for us to attack this to be respected and heard? Yeah, well, I'll speak for myself. Every legislator is different, but for me, I, I really do believe in, in what I think is the most effective is I, I believe in the squeaky wheel approach. So when you say a letter to me, it is more impactful if, if uh, you, you have 50 phone calls that come in um, than one letter signed by 50 people. Now, I do think that one of the, that often um, people overlook how impactful a constituent can be to an actual, to their specific elected official. Now, I, I do think in Spokane, um, you have a little bit more of a team approach where you have folks who are representing kind of the Spokane area and the way the legislative districts are drawn in a little bit of a different way where people do care about Spokane more holistically. Um, but, but when we get contacted by 
by folks we you know generally not always but we 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 know if they are a specific constituent or not that is impactful and if if you are contacting your elected official and saying um hey this issue is coming up it's a particular bill it's a budget issue whatever the case may be this is by far the most important issue for my family this next legislative session and we'll be watching it closely and i'd like to know um what uh, what you'll be doing to support it right um I do think it's helpful in a very, and again, polite, respectful. I, I don't want to give any wrong impression. It, I do think it's very important to, to, to you, know, you know, especially if you're representing an organization to be very thoughtful uh, in, in the way uh, that organization is, is represented. But it just as a constituent, look, we're your elected officials. We, we answer to you, you're the boss, right? Now, granted, lots of people have lots of uh, ideas and issues and sometimes those are conflicting and you can't, you can't make everyone happy. But I think when you can have a united front on a particular issue, especially if it's a particular bill or a specific budget line item, um, where it's clear that you, you are watching before the legislative session and you will be watching to see what happens after the legislative session, um, that helps. Because then when that budget discussion is taking place, let's say within the caucuses, um, in terms of what to prioritize, you want the members to say, um, I've heard from constituents on this issue. This is important to me. I hope you. Uh, I hope our. I hope uh, the legislature can, and the budget committees can work this out, um, because I. I, I want to be able to send a, a happy letter back to my constituents saying that we've been successful, in accomplishing this. Um, so I, I guess you know, not knowing you know specifically what what the specific item is, and and maybe not being informed enough on the issue to, to necessarily be helpful to help you refine it. What I would say is. To the extent you can kind of collectively identify what that is. Is it a budget item? Is it a, a, a particular bill? Um, let, let's say it's a particular bill. Asking your legislator to co-sponsor that legislation is not an unreasonable ask. Um, often people will say, well, will you support it? Well, it's easy for a legislator to say they will support something if it comes to the floor of the House of Representatives, right? But you, it's good first to identify, okay, what is the particular bill? What committee is it going to be heard in? And do uh, we have any of our members of this organization who are constituents of a member of that committee? And so let's start with that. That like starting early with that is always helpful. This bill will be heard by your committee. I am asking that you contact the chair that this bill be heard. And if it is, um, we ask that you vote for it out of committee. Those are specific tangible asks. Um, that are not unreasonable in any way. Um, and it's incumbent then on the member to, to really identify, is this something that, that is consistent with that member's values or not? And if it is, um, you can now hold that member accountable to those specific tasks. And I think one of the things that can be very frustrating to constituents is that they'll often be watching a bill, hoping it passes, does it pass? What, what, what have we heard? Oh, it passed or it didn't pass. Um, everything has different steps. And where I think uh, constituents can be most impactful is contacting um, their specific member where they might have a touch on the bill. It, you know, again, are they on the committee? Do they have the opportunity to co-sponsor it? Meaning sign on to the bill before at the time it's introduced. When it's introduced, they only have 48 hours to sign on to a bill. There are literally hundreds if not thousands of bills in the legislative session. Um, we don't sign on to everything. Things are flying by. Um, but if you get a, if you enough members specifically ask for that member to sign on to it as a co-sponsor, um, it's much more likely they're gonna contact their staff to keep an eye out for the bill when it's introduced to be more likely to sign on to it. And that's where you can start getting momentum to have support. And if you signed on to a bill, it's very unlikely a member, for example, would not uh, vote for it if they were in the committee as it's passing through. Now, sometimes bills are amended, things change, um, but, but hopefully that kind of answers your question. Like um, connecting early on specific tangible things really, really makes, makes the difference um, uh, and holding them accountable. Like, hey, I saw you didn't have a chance to sign on to it um, as a co-sponsor, uh, but it's going to be before your committee. Um, we, we hope you vote uh, to pass it. Or we hope you ask the committee chair to, to have the bill heard, for example. Um, and again, you, you can you can keep holding them, holding them accountable. Does that does that help or does it, uh, maybe, no, it maybe does. do that too? I don't mean to, yeah. to, you know, if that's something you're already doing, I don't mean to, 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 to mention that. But, but no, no. I think, it's all good. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just have also. Yeah, go ahead. I'm also wondering if there's a, um, a priority preference on in-person meetings, emails or phone calls. Does one of them kind of hold more water? Oh, I think in-person is, is, always, is always better when you can do it. Um, I, I, I would, uh, 
to, to me, uh, what I think would be most effective is, is doing both, which is calling the start of session. Hey, we have this bill, which you'll probably talk to just the legislative assistant about it. Um, this is very important, uh, is priority. It's, it's so important that I will be driving over from Spokane uh, to, to testify when the bill's heard, or I will be driving over to Spokane uh, to meet with the, the legislator over the next couple of weeks. Wh when, when is the legislator free over the next couple of weeks to meet? Right, with, I, you know, go ahead. With COVID right now, um, is a right. Zoom meeting just as important as yes. in person? Yes, and, and, okay. and let me be clear, we're going into a session that's gonna be like, a, like no other, right? So things are gonna be different. Um, but it does allow for more opportunities when there are Zoom committees for more people to testify from more geographically diverse regions on particular bills. I would strongly recommend uh, that that members sign up to to testify on on bills. And it, you know, again, even if the testimony is very short um, because of time constraints, let's say it's a minute. Um, trust me, more people signing in to be heard. That message is received by committees. Uh, as to the fact that people are watching as to what's happening to a particular bill. Okay. Thank you. What, what, what other questions do we have? I kind of have a, I have a question about the, um, it, it's sort of about the ballot, but sort of about um, how we're gonna get through the budget session coming up. Um, so on the ballot, there's that, um, Due to the state law, it requires in, when new taxes are proposed um, by Senate or passed by Senate um, that it must go to the ballot for people to either approve or reject. Do you know, is, is that ringing really a bell as to what I'm talking about? It does. And I guess okay. I, I, what I can do is give you a little of an update on that um, and, and, and stop me if, if, if you have more follow-up to the question. But uh, what, there once was a... a requirement that any type of time a law was passed that it then went to the people through the initiative process to either approve or deny, mm -hmm. uh, approve or reject, I'm sorry, the that particular revenue increase. Our state Supreme Court overturned that, um, that provision and found it unconstitutional um, because they said, well, the legislature has been granted the authority by the constitution to make those determinations. And so while those are still on the ballot and we saw it just a couple weeks ago, or I guess a week ago, I should say, um, even those are, those, that those are still there, they actually are only advisory. Uh, so they do not uh, impact the, the, the lawfulness of the legislative action. So if, if a revenue proposal has been, has been passed by legislature, it is now uh, the law, uh, uh, even if the, uh, the subsequent advisory vote uh, advised to reject it. So it doesn't change the, the legislature's legal authority to uh, determine what the, the revenue is for those particular purposes. So I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I want to make sure I clarify that. But if you have follow-up, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, no, I just, because um, yeah, my concern is I know the state is looking for, it. the question always remains is um, finding new sources of revenue to cover the things that, you know, people need covering for, especially as we talk about, like raising the cap on special ed, you need a source of revenue to, to pay for that. Um, and clearly the federal government isn't gonna do it because they don't pay um, the full amount of um, education funding we're supposed to get anyway um, uh, from, as, uh, from special ed as it is. So, um, you know, I was just thinking in terms of those advisory votes and, and how do we, you know, we need the supports in special education and for the IDD community and those advisory votes seem to block, um, create barriers to, you know, finding new ways to um, find revenue. Um, I know our tax system is kind of a mess anyway, but, um, you know, they're still asking for something like removing a cap. Um, we still need a source of revenue to pay for it, so. Well, you know, and I, I really think that one of the challenges on the, the special ed side for the education funding was the fact it was not included as part of the ultimate McCleary obligations mm -hmm. uh, initially as, as not being, um, you know, while I personally view it to be part of basic education, it, it constitutionally was not based on our Supreme Court's ruling. Um, and so I, I, I guess I, I keep coming back to doing what I know so many of you do, but, but really engaging others within your organization and, and groups to do as well, which is... Um, you know, fight for specific um, kind of 
line items in the budget. I don't mean technical line item. I mean, just general areas where you know funding is important for a particular agency, for example, or um, you know, for uh, you know, special ed funding in general, or whatever the case may be. Um, and communicating that clearly to legislator, um, that legislators that represent you, um, there are opportunities as well for legislators to sign on to letters in support of particular um, uh, budget, uh, budget proposals, budget line items, whatever the case may be, areas. Um, that is another area to be impactful, um, you know, where I, I could see an organization uh, like the ARC really doing an effective job statewide of putting together a letter and then getting legislators to sign on to that letter for a particular issue or area of, of funding. Um, you know, it's kind of like co-sponsoring a bill, you, you know, getting your legislator to sign on to that is a specific tangible ask um, that, that, you know, legislators will, will, will do if it's something consistent with their values. And that is where there's a difference. You know, this goes back to Shelley's original, you know, question where she's saying, well, where can be most impactful? Well, I do think the squeaky wheel of, of constituents contacting individually to members is impactful if it's a consistent, clear message that's being reiterated by those constituents. But uh, you know, kind of similar to what you're talking about a, of a letter. Well, what is impactful in the legislature is you know a letter signed on by 40 members of let's say the Democratic Caucus to the Democratic leadership saying um, this line item is very important and should be a priority during the budget discussions. Um, you know, the, those who are doing the budget negotiations are going to pay attention to that. And the same obviously goes for the Republican Caucus as well to communicate to their own budget negotiators as to something that's important. Um, uh, to, to be included in, in the budget. And then that way, it's more, more likely when things are, are being evaluated that it's something that is either not touched uh, as a part of some of the budget challenges we're facing or something that can be further supported if there's uh, revenue to, uh, to support that particular line item. What other questions do you have? This may be... Um kind of jumping out of this too soon, but I'm curious as to what um, a the, your role and as a treasurer and what the treasurer's role is. So, and is there advocacy that we do <laughs> to the, at the treasurer level or is that, um, is there, do you have impact on any funding that goes to the DD community? Sure. Uh, well, I guess I'll start by uh, saying, you know, I, I have a lot more insight at this point on, on the, the, the legislative experience uh, having done it for four years. Uh, you know, you know, maybe in a, in a short amount of time, I can uh, talk more about uh, my experience once I, I am treasurer. But what I will say is this is, I, I view most of these budget roles as being legislative decisions. So really focusing your attention on the legislature. The legislature determines the priorities. It's, it's meant to be that way. They, they're the ones who represent you in that capacity. They determine uh, new revenue. They determine, um, you know, where money goes within the budget. I do view the role of the treasurers to make sure there's certain financial guardrails uh, provided to the legislature to operate within so that our finances are being protected and our bond ratings uh, stay sound. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is limited to, um, you know, making sure that, that the legislature and budget leaders know what our bond rating agencies expect. And that means, uh, you know, our bond rating agencies right now have uh, advised that, you know, appropriate budget tools should be used uh, in determining uh, the budget. And what I'll be advising is saying that includes both revenue and uh, reductions in certain areas related to the budget, um, all, but also doing a measured drawdown uh, of our rainy day fund to meet s some of our current needs and an expectation as our bond rating agencies have indicated that federal dollars be used uh, to help offset um, some of the current state budget challenges. So, so it, it really is a multi, I'll stop with the fact that's what I'll be communicating. Those are the guardrails and the expectations, the bond rate agencies. That is the role of the treasurer in that process. Um, but going back to the role of a, a constituent in this, you can see why it's important to be communicating to all of your elected officials um, and how it's all interconnected. Well, that, that money from the federal government um, right now is very important to come to the states in order to meet some of the, the budget needs so that there are not further reductions or any reductions to particular line items within the budget. It's all interrelated. Um, and communicating that now to, uh, to your uh, elected official uh, in Congress who is part of uh, you know, uh, her caucus's leadership is, is very helpful as well in asking specific questions when uh, there will be support uh, for that type of additional federal funding. That, that is a, a specific question to be asking. Um, and and if, if, if your uh, members of Congress support that federal funding, because it's so critical right now as to the state budget 
as to whether or not uh, there are cuts and to an extent there are reductions, how much or whether there's funding to meet current or increase the needs to meet some of the COVID related challenges that we're facing as, as, a, as a state. Um, and so you, you, can, you can see how it's all, all interconnected. And I guess, again, my role as a treasurer is to make sure that that is communicated both to our members of Congress, uh, but also to the legislature in terms of the expectation of those federal dollars being a part of meeting our current budget needs. Thank you. Any, any other questions or anything I can offer some, some insight or help with? I was just kind of curious. Um... You know, we've you've mentioned and we've brought up the fact that we're going to go into a troubling budget cycle with um, everything that's going on. Um, there were like um, the governor set down recommendations for all organizations who receive funding through the state to do a 10% um, cut across the board. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear your outlook. Um, what you know, has that worked going into this next session or is there an expectation that there's going to be more dire cuts to it? Um, so just kind of correlating, I mean, what did that 10% reduction do and it is, is that, you know, helping at all? Sure, well, I guess what I'll say is my understanding is, is agencies have had to propose uh, cuts uh, consistent with that, but a lot of those decisions have not been made yet. And so, Agencies have an obligation within, you know, they're within the executive branch and all report to the governor to uh, to be essentially be ready and prepared in terms of what some of those reductions might look like. Um, but but ultimately the legislature is going to be making the decision related to that. The, the governor will will provide a, a proposed budget. Um, it would not be inappropriate, um, I don't believe, at this time to be communicating clearly to the governor's office uh, as to things that you care about because the governor will propose a budget to the legislature. The legislature will make the final determination, uh, but it never hurts if, if uh, certain areas within the governor's budget are, are fully funded. Um, you know, I think that is important because that delivers a message as well. Well, this is important to the governor, you, you know, this, you know to, to fully fund this, which gives some indication that there's been some thought that to make cuts in that area would be detrimental to um, the future of our state in a meaningful way. And so I, I think that um, communicating that now to the governor and, and, you know, and then obviously communicating to legislators, um, again, goes back to Shelley's point where, you know, I think the most effective communication is a repeat communication to all aspects of your government with a consistent message as to what specifically it is that you don't wanna see change, whether it's special ed, whether, you know, whatever, wh whatever it is, um, having that clear communication is I think very helpful because then it starts sending a message and especially when you have such an impactful um, uh, constituency uh, uh, as your membership is, where I think it can it can be very very impactful uh, to 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 have that type of advocacy. This is Darcy again. So are you thinking like so? There's a special ed tagline or something that that is consistent throughout everybody's message, but that um, so um, Julie tells her story as it relates to um, that that one I or that one tagline and then um, doesn't ask a please support this piece of legislation kind of thing or exactly so, and, so the message and, you know and whether in that way sure and and think of it I guess what I would say is if you think of it kind of you know from a legislative legislator standpoint you know you, you're hearing from hundreds or thousands of constituents um, I think a consistent message helps resonate something in the head of a legislator so when an issue comes up it, that they're thinking about it I think where sometimes things can sometimes be a challenge is if you know things are coming from multiple angles with different messages, even if it's trying to accomplish the same result, um, that that sometimes uh, it, it's it's less clear to a legislator to to be advocating on something that they know is important to to their constituents. Um, I, I do think that exactly what you were saying, Darcy, that if you can uh, be identifying it in in, in a clear message, whatever it may be, you know, wherever there is some general consensus, that's where it's most likely to, to, to be helpful. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on a particular line item, but it could be, you know, funding for a particular agency or not cutting funding for a particular agency or whatever the case may, may be. Um, the, the more clear that and consistent that messaging and repetitive that messaging can be, again, in an appropriate way. I don't mean necessarily calling the same legislator every day, um, I, I, but, but 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 making a phone call and, and you know calling in after something else happens with the bill that's totally appropriate 
hey, I called you before the legislative session. I see it's now passed uh, its committee. I'm calling again in hopes that you will support it now that it's passed the committee um, or it's being heard by the committee. I hope you, you, know, you contact the chair of the committee to let them know that this issue is important because this committee is hearing it, right? Like, you know, that at, at different stages, the same message, if something different has happened, that is totally appropriate. Um, and, and I think shows an awareness to the legislator that you are paying attention to this bill as it moves through the, through the process, or if it's a budget process, that the same, the same, uh, same advice holds as the budget moves through the process. Mike, um, yeah. one of the things I remember you're speaking when you mentioned to the league when we were there for lobby day last January, I do remember you presenting to us, um, and you're touching on it. You talk. You talked a lot about specifically asking for things, and not not just kind of broadly saying, "I need your support." Could Could you speak to that? Because I did have a chance to talk to like eight legislators that day, and I, I tried to do that, but I, I I thought that was really good advice. Yeah, I, I guess uh, you know what. Uh, no, thank you for that question because I, I I do want to make it clear that it's very easy for legislators to say that they will support something. And then they will never see it until it gets to the floor, floor of the house, at which point they're likely to vote to pass it, depending on which side of the aisle that they're on. What, what you want to be doing is asking for tangible actions by your legislators early in the process when they have, they're in a position to, to do something. I mean, you can't ask someone to co-sponsor a bill after that 48-hour window has passed and they no longer allow any additional co-sponsors. What you want to be asking that uh, early uh, before the legislative session or maybe right at the start of the legislative session. So they have an opportunity to look for it. And again, it's only if they share the, if it shares their values and, and different legislators have different approaches. I mean, I don't co-sponsor everything. I'm very, I'm a little more selective than what I co-sponsor, but other members are, are, are more uh, willing to co-sponsor multiple pieces of legislation. But, but what, I, what I know is if it's something I'm, an issue I'm not super aware of, if I haven't been contacted by multiple constituents to co-sponsor something, I might not give a close look at it. I might figure I'll deal with it when the issue comes up later. But if I'm hearing from multiple constituents before a bill is introduced, or at the moment a bill is introduced, asking uh, for me to co-sponsor it, I'm gonna at least give it a close look. I can guarantee you that. Um, and I think that's where, uh, again, uh, you know, especially an organization as, as impactful as, as the ARC, given its, its reach throughout the state, can be very impactful in, in reaching different members um, who are constituents of members throughout the state of various political, political parties. Any other questions? All right. Well, if, if not, I guess I'll, I'll. I don't know if I'll turn it back over to uh, turn it back over to my mom. If she has any closing closing remarks, or anyone else has any closing remarks at this point. But thank you for the opportunity to join you. It's it's great to uh, connect with you. Like I said, I, you know, I've had a chance to to uh, to join uh, the Ark of King County uh, quite a bit. So it's nice, particularly nice to join uh, its uh, sister organization in, in Spokane. So thank you for uh, for allowing me to to join all of you. And definitely swing by, you know, swing by the treasurer's office when it's safe to do so. Uh, when you come by and do your advocacy in, uh, in Olympia, uh, be sure to swing by the, the treasurer's office as well. It's in the Capitol building. So I'll, I can, I, I'd love to see you again once it's safe and we, we open up. Uh, you know, I'll be around at least for four years. So you'll, there'll be plenty of chance to swing by and say hi. And I hope you do. We may quiz you and see if yeah, you remember be all of us. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be great. No, it'll, 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 it'll be great. And you can give me an update on how everything's uh, going on a lot of the issues that you care about. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate your time and all the um, the help and advice that you've given us tonight. Um, it's it's very meaningful, and we're always looking for for ways to be meaningful. Yeah, and um, it, it's uh, we get different answers from different legislators, um, for sure. And I know this is going to be a really weird session. Um, you know, I do have one more question for you, and it's you know it may be completely out there, and you might not be able to answer it. But how well you will because I'm going to ask you how do you feel. So hopefully you'll know how you feel. Um, how do you feel about um, postponing this legislative session until January and not hitting it sooner in the face of all of these um, budget cuts? And are we waiting for some federal bailout? Was that the hope for pushing it back? Or, I mean, I know a lot of people that have really, uh, legislators that have really struggled and been unhappy with not being able to um, meet and kind of work some of this out prior to the session start in January. How, what do you feel about that? Well, I've publicly called uh, on multiple occasions for the legislature to call a special or for there to be a special legislative session 
um, earlier rather than later. I, I, I have, I, I've, I've been ready to, to go back uh, you know, on a moment's notice. And, and I, I do think it, it would be helpful to address it sooner rather than later. Um, that said, we did get some encouraging news with our last budget forecast uh, from about a month and a half ago, a month, month and a half ago, uh, that cut some of our, uh, that cut by half the, the, the budget deficit that we were looking to be facing in this next budget cycle. Um, you know, that said, um, you, you know, while that, that was encouraging news, uh, you know, I, I'm not just going to wait for the federal government to act. I feel like we need to be doing everything we, we need to be doing now to, to, to deal with these issues, to, to reduce the impact of, of some of these, these challenges. You know, th that said, um, the you know, legislature is meeting in, in, in two months, one way or the other. It's either less than two months or in two months. And it doesn't change the, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be contacting the legislators now as to the importance of these particular issues. Uh, because I, I do think that things are going to move a little quicker than sometimes they have in the past, given people's awareness of the need to address these issues uh, sooner rather than later. I so Sally and and I think and, and Darcy, I, I, I don't I have I don't have anything else to add. I just want to say I will get back to Darcy on a couple questions I had related to those ballot translations and the percent of I have percent of um, if any any group in Spokane reached that five percent and also the percent of Marshallese um, in our population. So I will get back to Darcy with those two questions if you could answers to those I hope that you could pass along. So thank you for having me and uh, thank you Mike for thank being you. with us. Yeah. No, my, my pleasure. It's good good to see all of you and uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat today. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I hope to see you again soon. All right. Yes.